My name is Samet. I work at Facebook AI Research. I only started working there six months ago. And uh, typically we work on outlandish problems, problems of the future, moonshots kind of things. Like, um, and basically I, today I'm going to be talking about uh, this <laughs> new, new class of algorithms called uh, deep, deep neural networks. Deep learning um, is getting really popular over the past couple of years because um, it's typically a paradigm shift of how you typically think about machine learning pipelines. Um, I first want to, well, I, I was basically expecting a few people in a room, like in the morning, not really interested. So I was like, I need to first get them a little excited. Uh, so my first slide was basically telling you where deep learning is basically creating revolutions. And I uh, just want to start off with like the, the, the fields that are completely dominated by deep learning today. But just like two or three years ago, they were in a completely di different uh, uh, paradigm, of, paradigm of things. And, so there's natural language processing. If you think about Siri or Cortana or like Google search, where you typically ask questions in a more natural language rather than typing keywords. Um, if, a, if a machine has to understand natural language, it, it has to, um, it, it basically has to have a language model that uh, it can process. And whenever you send in new words, uh, it needs to understand what's a noun and a verb and stuff like that. And natural language usually like was dominated by linguists, like people who knew what language was, what they knew all the grammatical rules, they knew like, oh, the noun comes before the verb typically, or they did like statistics of uh, na natural language, and then they had all these handcrafted rules. and. Um, over after like 2000 or so, uh, as we got started getting more and more data, um, natural language started taking a slight shift into having a lot of linguistic uh, prior knowledge and a little bit of machine learning. Typically, learning uh, like doing a lot of hard work with linguistics, and then and then finally doing the processing like. If you're given a typical sentence like, what's the weather today? Like the linguistic uh, engine would uh, process most of uh, uh, the words and then transform them into some features. And then there would be a model that would typically classify it as a weather check or something like that. And in the last four years or so, natural language processing has uh, <coughs> probably slightly more than four years, but natural language processing completely uh, got rid of the linguists. It was like, we don't need you guys anymore and, because um, computers got smart enough to learn language on their own. You just feed computers raw uh, Wikipedia and then they get a good sense of what English uh, should be. And if you give a new sentence, they, would, they can mark uh, things they can say, oh, your sentence is first of all grammatically incorrect with this probability, and um, like they basically are pretty good at like they're still uh, slightly off from humans in capturing long-term dependencies. Like if you say, like I went to the pizza shop and then I'm ordering a and a dash, and then the computer usually like for such a short-term dependency, it still might capture like okay, I'm ordering a pizza. But uh, if it's typically three or four sentences down, then it, it, it doesn't know. It, it probably like says Apple or uh, like. So contextual information is still lacking uh, in, um, in a lot of uh, these new age or old age algorithms. But uh, the, the, the old pipeline of doing traditional linguistic uh, feature processing and then putting it into a machine learning model is gone. And basically, people do end-to-end -end training with raw data now. Um, same with speech recognition. Speech recognition used to also be dominated uh, until even two years ago by 
these things called hidden Markov models. Um, typically, you extracted uh, features uh, like these very rich features that have like a history of 30 years of all kinds of uh, researchers finding out, oh, this is how the human ear works. These frequencies, uh, you hear these frequencies more than these frequencies. So we'll construct a feature uh, that, that, don't, like, that amplifies these frequencies slightly more. So there they are these uh, features that typically people used to use in audio processing called Mel frequency sexual coefficients, which are basically uh, modeled around how the human ear works. And in speech recognition, people used to have this notion of we should extract really good handcrafted features and then, and then we'll pipe it into a hidden Markov model or some kind of machine learning model that can classify each word as it comes, um, like if you utter like Apple, then it would take that segment of the speech and then it would like try to classify it as the word Apple. And speech recognition also like turned its head and now it's completely dominated by deep learning models where all you do is just give your input, C, uh, input like speed, raw speech file, like WAV file or MP3 file and then give the output text that it's supposed to be and if you give large enough data, like large amounts of data, then it figures everything out for itself. Like you don't have to have any human in the loop except for like training the model itself and looking at the results and being like, oh, this works. Um, one of the most dominating fields is computer vision, which is um, where you can, um, you can understand, like a machine can understand what's going on in an image or a video, for example. Like, it sees a picture of a, like a boy walking in the park with a dog and it says it's a picture of a boy walking in the park with a dog. Like, and like you can have many different kinds of uh, vision problems which are very common in robotics uh, and also for image search, like if you ever search for an image of uh, typically, I want an image with the beach in the background and a, a bar in the foreground or something like that. Like usually image search until uh, just about two years ago uh, used to work around keywords of the text that surrounds the images in a web page. So if there's like text that surrounds the image in a web page, then like whatever search you do, it will just be based on that text and like you, like machine wouldn't actually look at the image, like look at the raw pixels and be like, oh, it might be like a beach in the background. And um, again, deep learning uh, combined with the power of GPUs, the fact that GPUs are really fast and deep learning algorithms can run uh, really fast on GPUs, combining that with training larger deep learning models and hardware catching up, uh, you basically have most of the image search uh, uh, al algorithms now uh, also recognizing visual content and understanding what objects are there in the scene or like if you give a particular uh, image of a person like it can be like oh this is where the hands are and this is where the legs are and there's like a lot of applications like these in uh, robotics where uh, a robot has to navigate through and, uh, and uh, sorry where a robot has to navigate through and uh, understand stereo vision. Like you give your left and right image uh, of, of cameras placed right, like just like the eye, if you have cameras placed right next to each other and you want to calculate the depth of you, uh, typically it's very natural for us humans, but it's a really hard problem. Uh, doing stereo vision, uh, which, is what I, uh, which is like calculating the disparity map or the depth map, is also a hard problem and typically you had pretty good uh, algorithms in the past where like people extracted really nice features that could correlate one point uh, in the left image with another point in the right image and then they could calculate the disparity. And now like there are these new age uh, deep learning models that are like we don't need to know anything. We don't need a human in the loop. All you give us is the left image and the right image and you give enough of those I'll figure out how to like how to output the disparity map. Um, lots of robotics applications, like controlling a robot, 
um, like if you want a robot to basically uh, go around, um, like forget a robot, like think of the Google car, like the self-driving car, like it has tons of vision and like LiDAR sensors coming in and um, it needs to understand where pedestrians are, it needs to understand what traffic signs are, it, need to, it, it needs to understand like uh, like the 3D, it needs to map in real time the 3D world. All of these are mostly moving to deep learning uh, algorithms. They used to be done in a very hard way where like a typical grad student spends like four years handcrafting features for these things and, and like he gets a PhD and he's like, look at this, I made this car go slightly better and then now there's like deep learning algorithms that are like, we don't wanna know how you think, I will think for ourselves. And recently in uh, like, start, like modern physics, the way it works is usually you have tons of data coming from like, for example, the Large Hadron Collider uh, is this huge, um, is this huge, uh, I don't know the exact terms, but it, it basically collides these mic particles with each other and uh, it tries to, they, they aggregate tons of data on, uh, like when these collisions happen, they, they aggregate all kinds of measurements and then they try to uh, statistically verify whether a particle was there or not. And typically, like a lot of this was done with machine learning models, but it was still really hard. Like people spent like lots of time trying to verify whether what the model, uh, like they, they wouldn't get results from one single model. They would typically try to find it uh, via a combination of many different machine learning models and then also have like people pour over the data and verify that whatever the model uh, predicted was correct. And uh, like recently there's been like pretty, like pretty good research coming out that says like all of this handiwork is not needed, just like feed the data into a deep learning model and if you have enough labels, if you have enough supervised supervision, then it can figure out for itself and it will give you, when, a new, when new data comes in, it will give you the answers that you want. Like it can predict probabilities of a particular particle appearing or not. And in computational biology, like in gene sequencing and stuff, um, I don't know, like I'm not a computational biologist, I don't know the exact terms, but I do know like there's been a couple of recent papers that came out that uh, do uh, gene sequencing uh, and uh, like other kinds of computational biology um, just using end-to-end -end deep learning. Uh, and there's been some work basically, uh, like if you give, if in, in a lot of uh, uh, like research where you uh, take a picture or take a, a slide of um, some kind of blood sample or like uh, a tissue sample and then you want to find whether it's cancerous or benign, uh, then typically uh, like I used, I interned at Siemens a couple, like a few years ago and the typical pipeline was that you had people identifying features that like 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 a way a doctor thinks like a doctor would see the slide and be like okay these are uh, likely cancerous part like cancerous uh, uh, cells in 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 this uh, tissue slide and uh, people trained uh, like typically uh, in at Siemens I remember they spent a lot of time building these handcrafted features that would uh, help. Uh, automatically classify such such slides, and now you have no like a lot of people giving that up and and going the deep learning way where they basically have labels like they have a slide and they have a label on whether there's a cancerous uh, cell present or not, and then it every like it, like the algorithm figures everything out for itself end to end just raw pixels on one side and the correct answer on the other side. Um, and I didn't cover this, but uh, if you look at typical ads, uh, ads like, like optimizing your click-through rates or uh, if you want to optimize your ad viewership, et cetera, 
you typically get a lot of usage data about like whether a user clicked on something or whether how, like whether um, a user went to a particular website or so on. And then there's like lots of people who uh, like hand like typically handpick the features that are more relevant than the other, and they weight them up, and then then they send it to like a, a, a regressor of some sort, probably like an optimizer in Excel, for example, and uh, they would, uh, they, like if they can predict slightly better whether a user is gonna click an ad, then they, um, they will uh, make more money. So these are still like very much handcrafted and people actually like pick out good features and bad features and weight them slightly higher, but uh, there is some. There are some papers that came out that are like you don't have to figure anything out, like this. Like you just give all the features you have, and then um, the the deep learning algorithm will figure out the the underlying structure and underlying dependencies, correlations, etc. Okay, so that was to get your attention that there is a lot of places where deep learning is being used. And uh, it's here to stay. NVIDIA just invested tons of money on their new GPU to make it deep learning ready in the sense that they gave up on all their double precision computations uh, in their new GPU and they made it purely float precision and then they invested a bunch of money to, um, to basically provide everyone with highly optimized code that can l run deep learning algorithms. And there's like a lot of companies building hardware just like FPGAs and ASIC chips just to run uh, deep learning algorithms for like, and uh, I think Tesla announced that they are going to be using deep learning for their car uh, and whatever autonomous capabilities they are going to uh, provide. So yeah, it's here to stay. The industry is heavily investing on it like Facebook, Google, Twitter, Apple, like all of these people are just, let's just say they're going crazy over anyone who can understand deep learning and they are trying to transform all of their typical machine learning pipelines into deep learning pipelines. Um, now I will, like I think I covered most of traditional machine learning. Basically, if it's a particular image, you extract certain features like, oh, you have an edge in this image, it's of this orientation. Uh, or like if it's audio, you extract these highly engineered features based on how humans, how, man, how human ears work and so on. And then you, you put that, like you send them into like some kind of machine learning classifier and like this is completely true. This is how it used to work in, in, in most uh, uh, grad research labs or probably companies I wasn't working back then. Like you find a grad student and you're like, go find good features like engineer really good features that work for uh, this problem of maybe finding dogs in images. Like I had a friend who did this for three years. Like he, he basically spent a lot of time sp like uh, trying to find really good features or trying to construct really good features that separated dogs from cats in images. And then you, you find another student who basically takes the code of the first student and he extracts it over all the data you have and then you, you, you typically uh, you send this, send this uh, extracted features into some kind, of, uh, like some kind of machine learning model like boosted decision trees or like logistic regression or like terms that you might have heard before or like if you, if you haven't had much experience in machine learning, just think of like some kind of Excel solver that solves that, like, like takes in some data and fits it uh, uh, to, to uh, fits it into a model. Um, and then what happened was, like deep learning has been around for a while, but like it's just the hardware catching up and like slightly new tricks coming in. Um, deep learning, basically what it does is it just says, just give me your raw data and then um, give me the labels that at the other side that have to predict and I will figure everything out. And it generalizes really well. Like, like a lot of machine learning models can do this, 
but they only work on the training data itself. Like they would basically overfit. That's that's like the typical term we use, where uh, you show a hundred images of dogs, and then you say that's a dog, and then it would say, oh, perfect. And then if you show the same hundred images again, it would get every single one of them right. But if you show a new image, it would typically balk, and that's called uh, generalization of like. Basically, that's called uh, overfitting. And like people usually in machine learning, uh, they judge the model by how well it generalizes to new samples. And deep learning models have showed that it can figure out the, the underlying structure of the data for itself, but can it, like the actual structure that generalizes to new samples that haven't been uh, seen before. And I'll, I'll go briefly explaining, like in an algorithmic way, what like what actually goes in, inside, like, and it's super simple. You'd be surprised that it works so well. Um, and this was like a small slide that like this is a trend I've been noticing in the last couple of years, where like you typically, if you want to like, if you want to win some kind of Kaggle competition, or like if you if you want to impress your boss, you pick the problem up, and then you use a standard deep learning framework and train a bunch of models, uh, and then you average the predictions from these ensemble of models, and then you pretty much win <laughs> at whatever <laughs> competitions or life. Um, OK, this set of slides will just be explaining how what deep neural networks are. Uh, and. Uh, so deep learning and deep neural networks, by the way, are uh, highly overlapping in practice. But deep learning just means that uh, you have a changed cascade of nonlinear transforms, meaning like um, it will be clearer once I show you some figures. So this is a typical neural network. You have your input. It can be like a bunch of numbers. Like an image is a bunch of numbers. An audio signal is a bunch of numbers. Uh, Typical ads feature data, like incoming data that you get from like user profiles, is a bunch of numbers, right? Everything's a bunch of numbers. So you give your input, which is a bunch of numbers, and you do some transformation of those numbers. Like, let's say you say, I take the square of every single uh, number in my in my input, and then I apply a sign operation over it, and then that's my output. This is a very hypothetical example. That's a neural network by itself. Um, and what's a deep neural network? Well, a deep neural network is just like the same thing, except that it's it's like deeper. It's there's more <laughs> there's there's more nodes. Like you have your, there's a lot of computation uh, between your input and your output, and those all depend on each other. Um, so you have your input, and you have some weights that you learn over time uh, in, during your training phase. And you say, let's say you just take a multiplication of your input and your weight, and then you apply some kind of nonlinear transformation. Uh, and then you again do that on, on the output that comes out of the sigmoid there. And you chain these operations um, until the end. So, Essentially, it's just a hierarchical transformation. You have the input, and then you have some feature that comes out of the, of the first stage. And then you want to learn uh, another hierarchy of features. Uh, and then you want to learn another hierarchy of features and inception. So what's the difference between neural networks and just computation graphs is the way they're trained. They're trained via this algorithm called backpropagation, where um, it's a very simple algorithm. All it does is once you get, like, once you process the input all the way to the output, and you have the right answer, like during your training phase, you have what you predicted and you have the right answer, right? Um, so during the training phase, you, you have a typical function called a loss function that computes how far away you are from your right answer. And it can just be a simple square loss, which is like, x minus y whole square. Uh, and then you take the derivative with respect to that loss. And the derivative typically just lets you, um, 
like it's out of the scope of this talk, but basically you can basically say, I will slowly move towards what my derivative says and eventually I will come to the ideal solution. This is how typically, um, this is called gradient descent and it's used everywhere to train everything. It's not neural networks or anything like that. However, in neural networks, the cool thing is, with, like you can calculate the derivative with respect to every single weight that was in your network. But what that means is you can compute how much a typical weight that so people call these neurons, but really they're just like numbers that you learn over time. Um, you can calculate with respect to your output and your correct answer, you can contribute how much a particular weight contributed to the, the correctness of the answer. You can be like, neuron X in layer Y contributed to the answer being wrong by 0.5 in, in value. And then you can adjust that neuron slightly um, so that it doesn't do the same mistake the next time. And you keep doing this over many, many training samples, and eventually all the neurons adjust themselves in a way that they learn uh, what's the, like they learn these features over time. And one typical trick that's been critical to a lot of uh, these new age deep learning algorithms is uh, convolutions. Convolutions are nothing new. They've been around for like ages and they are the bread and butter of signal processing people. If you ask an electrical engineer uh, about convolutions, he'll be like, yeah, what about them? They're like obvious. Um, so in, in neural networks, Typically, if you give an image, which is like a set of numbers, right? You just flatten the image, like if it's, a, it's a 2D image in this case, but the computer doesn't know the structure. It's just like a blob of memory with a bunch of numbers. There, it doesn't know where the 2D is, where, like, where 1D is, where, where if a particular number is below a particular number or above a particular number. It just knows that there's just a bunch of numbers of, like, of pixel magnitudes, like how bright a pixel is or not. But typically they're between zero and 255 for eight images. And with the neural network, all it, you basically give all of these numbers into the first layer and then you compute some features and then uh, the first layer goes into the second layer and so on, it, it goes to the end. Learning, typically for 200 cross 200 images is tiny, like in your, in your uh, cell phones these days you have like 3,000 cross 4,000 images or something like that. It's like, even for such a tiny, tiny image, you have like two billion parameters, which means you have to learn two billion numbers uh, during your training phase, and that's huge. And to learn so many parameters, which is like a lot of numbers, you need tons of data. And one thing people thought about um, was how can I reduce the, how can I reuse parts of, like, parts of the learned features? Um, and they basically said, well, like, this, the low-level images, like edges and corners and stuff, they appear everywhere, irrespective of the, the position in the image, in the sense that you would find an eye, like a human eye, at many places in an image, it's not unique to f the fifth pixel in the right. So you wanna share a learning of these, of these eye filters, for example. So in a convolution, uh, you basically want to make sure each of the filters you learn at particular locations, they're all learn shared, like, in, like they all uh, share uh, the learning between them. And that's typically what, what happens. And a convolution is basically, I take the, that, uh, a certain region of my image, and then I do a simple uh, product with a set of weights. And then I go to the next part, and then I do another product, and like basically a, a matrix, a, a, ve a vector multiplication. So I do a product and then I do a sum, I will get a single number, right? So that will be the output. And like you basically do that over all uh, 
parts of the image, and that's basically your second layer, like the first node in your neural network, if it was a convolution, that would be the output, and then you would apply some kind of nonlinear transform on it, and then you would go to the next phase. Um, extremely simple idea. Basically, the idea is, like on the very small scale, you want to share what you learn, and then you apply the same trick for the next layer. You say, I want to learn a hierarchy of features that are shared among themselves in the sense that I want to construct a nose from a set of edges that are like, oh, if, it, if there's orientations like this in my image, then that's probably a nose. And then I want to combine the nose responses, uh, which appear, say, in the first layer. Uh, I want to combine them with the, with the eye responses and then learn a typical face filter. And you can make up examples like these uh, by the dozen. Like you can say, when I'm talking, I have only a, a few set of syllables, irrespective of, uh, irrespective of like, like where, uh, like if I, if I have a long speech that I'm giving, then I, like a lot of syllables reoccur at various parts of time. Like I can, so you wanna reuse this information and and syllables can combine into words, and you want to reuse the, the learning, the parameters that learn certain words, and so on. And you can apply this to like any data. If you have uh, like non-natural data, like, like ads data, I keep coming up to this example. I've never, worked, I've never worked in ads, I don't know. It's just easy to think of, maybe. Um, if you have ads data, you, you, you can basically share certain features with uh, each other. Like for example, if you have four users that you're simultaneously trying to optimize, you learn the same set of features. Uh, like so you, share the, you share the feature, like the numbers you learn over all four users or like certain groups of people and so, or so on. Um, so one uh, really hard problem uh, that has been running since like 2008 or so, I, I think it's around that time, is you have a million images all labeled with what, uh, what object is there in the image. And the competition, this is called ImageNet, was that you have to predict, the, the machine has to predict what, what object is in the image. And there are hard objects in there. Like there's like this, there are lobsters of like five kinds or something like that. And I wouldn't know uh, like what kind of lobster that is. And, uh, so basically, the competition has been like, up till, up till 2012, the best people could do was 26% uh, error on the top five uh, error, which means like at least in the first five predictions, you have your right answer. And these were all using uh, handcrafted features. People were like, we have to use edge orientations and then combine them with texture. And then, like, uh, and then, like, color is important. Histograms of colors are important. And then you combine all of these into some kind of uh, uh, classifier, and then, like, that's the best they got. And then in 2012, one deep learning model appeared. Someone figured out they could train a deep learning model at scale on a GPU. This guy called Alex Krasevsky. And he basically bumped up the error by a huge margin, like 10%. Uh, and human performance is three to five percent, like because we don't know what different kinds of lobsters there are, or like it's like knowledge would also be slightly hard, and the data set might have mislabeled images and so on. So there's a guy called Andre Karpati. He sat down and he tried to do the challenge himself as a human, and he got like three percent. And there were a bunch of people uh, who he hired to try to figure out what the average human performance was, and it was about like four to five percent. And by 2015, you have deep learning models that are 4.5 percent, uh, which is very close to human performance. I mean, it is, it is uh, as good as it, the average human performance. And these deep learning models actually are starting to, to look uh, to to uh, understand images as well as humans do. 
And these are just a bunch of pretty pictures showing you that that you can use this in like segmentation or stereo. Stereo is the one example I showed you on the right where you have images on like where a car, a car is driving on a road and you have images from its left camera and right camera and you have to predict the disparity map uh, there. And all you did is give those two images to a deep learning model and eventually you, you have in your training data, you have the correct disparity maps. And uh, during test time, they, like the models can figure out and predict the right disparity map with reasonable accuracy. And another application um, where you give a, 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 a image of a human and then it can uh, label all the joints. Uh, of, of the human. You can do it for like hand tracking as well. If you want to like say I give a hand and I want to I want to uh, figure out where like my index finger is and where the tip of the index finger is so that I can do it for like mouse tracking or stuff like that. And then there's these interesting examples where a, a deep learning model generated a new image like all those faces you see, those are not real faces. Those are faces that the model generated, uh, except for the ones in the yellow box. The yellow boxes are like real faces. And uh, also, like, it, like it, it's really hard to generate natural images still, like actual full natural images. But it's, the problem is like people are training these models that can do this also at a pretty decent uh, rate. And for video, it's the same thing. You just like, you give the video a few frames at a time and uh, eventually you tell it what the right answer is supposed to be. And uh, it learns to basically uh, describe videos. You give a video and then it will like type out a sentence describing what the, what's happening in the video. Like, oh, a cat is chasing a laser. Um, and oh, this slide looks terrible, even though it looks really good on my machine. You can't really see it, but it, for NLP, it's the same idea. Like you give a particular sentence, and then each each word uh, is uh, represented by a, a random set of numbers initially, and then uh, these numbers are eventually learned. You have like a convolution layer, and like pulling layers and so on and eventually you have like the right representations that you learn. And then there are also character level models where you just give your text and each character is represented by some number. And uh, eventually if you want to do sentiment analysis, for example, you want to give a, a text, a piece of text and then you want to predict what sentiment there is. Like for example, if you have someone who, a user who wrote a review but they actually didn't rate uh, rate uh, rate the review like from one to five stars. If you actually want to automatically give the rating, then you can say, if you can predict, oh, this user was really happy, or this user was moderately happy, or this user was pissed off or angry uh, with this business. So he would have given a review of one star. Um, so sentiment analysis or like machine translation um, is like you give a blob of text and then it spits out in English and the, it spits out the blob of text in French. That's, and this can apply to arbitrary languages. And the good thing about this is that, um, is that it uh, doesn't need to understand linguistics. So if you just have a lot of text in a language who typically most people are not experts in. Like for example, in America, you can't find easily someone who's like a real expert in Slavic languages. Um, or you can say in India, you can't find someone who's really an expert in like some language that's, I don't know, not part of the Indian subcontinent. So when you have such problems where you don't have domain experts, you can basically give a blob of text that you have and a blob of text on the other side, that's the correct translations. And then if it can actually get really good results, uh, you have a lot of uh, work that's already done for you and you can, ex you can scale these algorithms to other domains really easily. Um, 
once you have uh, your pipeline. And I explain convolutions and how they are used a lot in, in deep neural networks and how that's important. And the second uh, is recurrent neural networks. So all the networks I explained to you so far, they don't have a notion of time. Um, even though the video ones uh, do, they basically don't. Like the video uh, ones, the video deep learning algorithms I showed you, they basically process a few frames at a time, predict something, and then you like aggregate it with another, you aggregate all of these predictions with another model for the whole video. So recurrent nets actually have a notion of uh, time. Um, basically, they have a recurrent connection that is basically saying, uh, my input comes in, and then I get my give my output, but I also keep part of the the uh, what I saw here uh, in some in in some kind of memory here that I will also reuse along with the input for my next sample. So you keep things, uh, you remember things uh, um, that you've seen in the the past, and. I have a slide explaining how why it's, uh, you have to, you can't train recurrent nets in this recurrent way uh, because the simplest way to explain it is it's a while loop with no bounds. Like you, you don't know where it went, it's like, you don't know how many states you have to keep or like how to back propagate through that. So typically what people do is they say, it's a recurrent net but I only look at 30 time steps back in time. Um, like everything before the 30 time steps I throw away. It's just done for like scaling purposes and like learning through back, back propagation. And there are these, uh, no, there's this, there's these, uh, I showed you the graph with a, a few computational units and I showed um, a matrix multiplication and I showed like convolutions and those are nodes in the graph and there are nodes in this, in this neural network graph, which are memory units, which basically they can uh, store some kind of memory that will be kept around uh, for a longer term. And this is done automatically. You don't tell it what to store in that memory. It just figures out that, okay, this piece of information seems to be important to capture long-term dependency. So I'll keep it around for the, until the next time I see something that needs this memory, and then I will get it out of my cell and I will erase it or something like that. And recurrent nets with these long term, long, these are called long short term memory cells, but there are also other memory cells that are under heavy research. Um, it, they have this ability to incredibly capture uh, problems like machine translation, uh, which need long term dependencies. Uh, to be captured, so you given a whole sentence or paragraph of of some some English sentence, and it can actually, with reasonable accuracy, spit out the French sentence. And the way it does it is, it consumes all of the English sen all, all of the English sentence or sentences, and then once you say, okay, that's it, that's the end of my English sentences, it will start spitting word by word uh, the 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 translation. So. It's uh, because this is not domain specific and you don't need to be a linguist. Like someone actually, my friend Wojciech, at, he, he's an intern at Facebook, he l tried to make it learn to execute Python programs. And like not full, full Python, but like a subset of Python. And like he basically, you can generate infinite amount of samples, right? Because you know how Python, like you have a parser already. And, uh, he basically generated these random, uh, random uh, Python programs, and then he um, computed the right answer from the interpreter. And he gave it this. This input given here is just raw strings. Like I mean, you just give this whole program, like program.py, and you just give that to your to your neural network model, and it it gives you the right answer and again in terms of like it spits out one number after the other, which is the right answer. Of course, over here, the target is widely off. Uh, no, well, these are different examples. But um, he did, like, the program does pretty well at, at a, lot of, uh, uh, a lot of simple 
uh, for loops if like it learns how to do for loops, for example, and uh, it learns how to add things. I mean, he never told it, okay, J plus equal to 920 means add and accumulate, right? It just learned for itself after seeing enough samples that, okay, you have probably had to accumulate 920 into J, and it doesn't even know what addition is. So it's all from scratch. And I thought that was a little mind blowing. And you have these uh, memory networks that my colleagues at Facebook are building, which are like, you give some, some short, I mean, this only works for short pieces of text now. Uh, we are trying to scale it up to like huge pieces like Wikipedia. But basically, they give like a short piece of like uh, Lord of the Rings. And then you, it, once it processes the, the, the piece of text, you can ask it questions. You're like, where is the ring? And then it will be like, it will tell you. And then you can also ask questions like, where was the ring before Frodo dropped it off in, in Mount Doom? And then it will actually figure out what you're asking. And it will be like, oh, the ring was, it, it gives only a single, uh, like right now, I think it's limited to like giving just like single word answers. But it figures out all the dependencies and it, it can, uh, give you the right answer. And in terms of implementation in engineering, uh, these deep learning models are really, really computationally heavy. And also, they need tons of data. So typically, what people do is they get all the data they have, and they augment it with, with, with basically more data, which is fake, but which looks very real. Like, if you have an image of a dog, you can be like, this is the image of a dog. I'll rotate it slightly. That's a new image of a dog, or stuff like that. They can do like slight tricks, like I'll change the color balance of the image. That's that's a new sample. Um, and people uh, do a lot of data augmentation typically. And uh, for implementation, you basically use GPUs because most of the operations, like convolutions and matrix multiplies, they are much, much faster on a GPU than, than on your usual CPUs. Um, and for example, the models that run ImageNet, um, they probably will take like six months to train on a CPU, and they train in, in a week on a GPU, a week or so. And like the model that won in 20, 2012, it, it, now it trains in like a few hours, like three or four hours. It's still a long time, I understand, but it's learning everything from scratch. So you can make the model use prior knowledge. Like you can make it train for the ImageNet challenge, and then you can be like, OK, I just want uh, to retrain the last layer, which means like I want to use all of the knowledge it learned, perceptive knowledge it learned uh, over ImageNet. Uh, you can make it use all of that knowledge and then just train the last layer to, on a new problem. Like, I want to make it uh, understand crowd of people from like a single person or something like that, some arbitrary problem that it doesn't know how to tackle. It still relearns it, and this happens typically with, within like minutes uh, because it doesn't actually have to learn everything like learn perception from scratch. It can retrain itself from a point. Uh, just, just like people, like we, we, if we have to learn that a new object is something, you, you basically learn it pretty quickly. But if you, like if you count from uh, since you were born, how long it took to learn a particular object, that's like many years, right? Um, and it is kind of an engineering feat in the sense that these are, this is not just like some hacky research code. Like, like you have to optimize, you have to do distributed training, you have to uh, uh, code for GPUs, and uh, you have to make sure all of your uh, caches are being hit properly, and you want to make sure you have enough occupancy on, on your uh, GPUs, and you want to make sure like your CPU to GPU memory transfers are not being a bottleneck. Uh, so it's, and if you want to do it at scale, like let's say you want to train, a, like I just described 
the most typical models to train on a single GPU, but what if you want to scale it up to like a thousand GPUs or like you have, you don't have a GPU, but you have like 10,000 CPUs lying around. Like what if you want to just use all of those? Uh, Google did that in 2012, I think. They trained a model on like 20,000 GPUs. 20,000 CPU cores, I think. I can't remember the exact number, but something ridiculous like that. So these, like, the engineering part of this is definitely non-trivial, and that's why I still have a job. And, but the good thing is we are making everything open source. Like, you can, like, there are frameworks like Torch, which is, uh, I'm one of the developers for Torch, so it's a shameless plug. But we use that at Facebook, Google, uh, I think, Twitter, and there's a lot of industry usage and a few research labs use it. And then there's Cafe, which is, uh, Torch is written in Lua, so it's basically people are like, uh, should I learn a new language? Uh, I don't know. So Cafe was written in C++, and you take a configuration file of what the network should be. And uh, it, it's the same thing. And then there's Tiano, Keras, Lasagna. These are all in Python. And all these frameworks, they're doing the same thing. Like, they have a syntax to define what your graph is, so your neural network. And then they implement every graph in the neural network, kind of implements the derivative with respect to the input and with respect to its parameters so that you can do back propagation. And that's all there is. It's like, at a, at a, at a fundamental level, it's extremely simple stuff. I, you can't see this, but this is like, I was just showing syntax. Like, this is a model that won the ImageNet challenge, and that's all it took. Just defining this graph and then saying, go train it on like tons of data. Um, the trends are you have like deeper nets are working better, smaller convolutions so that you share more and more work better, recurrent nets with LSTMs, multiple GPUs to train a single model, multiple machines and multiple GPUs to train a single model. And there are these weird meta algorithms coming like like Wojciech py learning to execute Python, which are there's other stuff from this Google DeepMind initiative, which is like a neural Turing machine, like like a like actual a machine that are, can hopefully learn to arbitrarily execute anything ever because it's a Turing machine, right? And and you have other kinds of memory units coming in uh, that are being heavily researched, and people are like, oh, look at this! If you stick this in your neural network instead of a long short-term memory unit you can learn long-term dependencies better for cheaper, stuff like that. And um, the challenges are you still, it's a hard problem to scale up for big data, like videos. Like videos are, they're like hard to work with. And, um, and all of the uh, well, discrete optimization, don't worry about that, that's out of the scope of this talk, it's just like, you, like you, all of the numbers you learn are continuous, like float numbers. Like they don't, they're not integers. They're not one and two. They can have um, 1.5 and so on. But if you actually want to learn discrete numbers, uh, it's a hard problem. It still hasn't been solved. And that's all I had for today. And I will take any questions you have as long as they're easy to answer. Could you like so? Yeah. Hi, uh, Thanks for the great talk. So, uh, so can you summarize? You know, in a, uh, uh, what is the key difference uh, deep learning has that you don't need to label the data? Do you still need to label the data, right? And so, you know, the hard work from feature engineering will go into labeling and how how this is addressed in the industry right now. Yeah. So you can basically have labeled data for one domain and learn a lot of the feature engineering over that domain, and then like just reapply it to a domain which doesn't have much label data. It's, uh, it seems to be working pretty well. And then there's this whole set of deep learning research that has been going forever called unsupervised learning, where without any label data, you can basically like learn things for yourself. And that's also an open area of research which is not ready yet, but semi-supervised learning, which is like you, you like you learn 
you have some labeled data and some non labeled data that works pretty well. Just wanted to ask about the, uh, you know, the Facebook view on like the Future Life Institute and the ethics behind this because this is kind of where you know, we're taking, you know, we've got several prognosticators out there, Bill Gates, et cetera, Elon Musk, saying that the, uh, the world's coming to an end with artificial intelligence, potentially. I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Well, first of all, I am not going to speak for Facebook. I came here on my own, and my views are of my own, and all that legal stuff. But I think these algorithms are pretty stupid. They still can't do anything. So whatever question you're asking, I think you should freeze it and ask it again. And when you actually see that these algorithms are not stupid. They still work on particular domains fairly well. So along those lines, I'm wondering, um, you kind of touched on it, but what are the actual constraints? Like what are the things that are uh, holding this back and you know, its ability to improve? And what's the rate at which those are improving? Like is it hardware? So we should expect exponential um, improvement in this as Moore's Law continues? Or is it more like linear stuff like research and, and things so that are going to take a lot of time. It's a combination of both. Hardware, definitely. We still are constrained by the fact that we had to train a model for two weeks and wait for the results and so on. If you, if you could do it in like five minutes, uh, like most other machines, like, like boosted decision for us or something like that, then doing trying out different things becomes uh, not like doesn't become much of a problem so hardware uh, definitely it's a strong candidate for basically improving uh, the field and research uh, even more so but the good thing is the research has been moving at a really breakneck pace where the hardware is actually not able to keep up sorry can you Tell us a little about uh, deep face algorithm, and I really want to know how I can opt out. How you can opt out? Um, I think, like, as far as I know, I did the same, is you actually have an opt out box that says don't tag images or something like that. But that's, that's all I know about Facebook. <laughs> Um, I, well, deep face, like the whole paper is published, like in the sense that the whole algorithm is published. There's nothing secretive about it. Um, and I think it's just, it can recognize you among your friends and there's an opt out button that says, don't let anyone tag me. It's pretty obvious. There's nothing like revolutionary going on here. <laughs> So two, two quick questions. Uh, first of all, how is this really different from pattern recognition, which is what, basically what you're doing in a convoluted way, and how reusable is any given model across different targets? So if you train a model to, to, to recognize a dog, can you use the same model to recognize a cat? Or is it specific to the object that you're training? Well, for your first question, this is just a glorified pattern recognizer that can figure out what the patterns are for itself. And for your second question, yes, you can basically train a model to uh, learn only how to see dogs. And then you can just take the last few layers, throw them out, put new, last, new layers in the last, and then uh, the training for a cat becomes much better. Does that require some intervention so you can't have one long No, it's, it's, it's like you can. You can do that too. Yeah, you can. You can take the same model and be like, just keep showing it cat images and say it's a cat. It will eventually change its weights for the last. It's yes, yeah. Well, it depends on like, if you never show the dog again and only keep showing cat images, then it will forget eventually what a dog looks like. Just like how you don't remember what happened 40 years ago. Um, probably, sorry. And it's, you, if you keep showing it occasionally dog images, then it will remember. Um, sure. Are there a developer or open source data set for the 
uh, that, that you can work. There are publicly available data sets that are already trained. Can I find data sets that are trained for dog? Yeah, absolutely. You have trained models available publicly. Um, you can find them on like GitHub or like there's there's this thing called Model Zoo by uh, the Cafe Framework, where like p p people can contribute mo models that are trained, and you can just download and use them. Thank you.